नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय निबद्ध भिमान यम धाट प्राणीना वधा तथा नैवाया कौप्यथे यीबद्धो तद्धत्म वधानैवल्यामखिलात्म पर धमकर्तुर् हिंसा खेन से कौप्यथे यीबाधिमान प्राणीन वधा तथा नैवल्यामखिलात्म पर धमकर्तु हिंसा खेन से कौप्यथे
yat in which nibadha bound abhimana false conception i am this tat of that body vadhat from the annihilation praninam of the living beings vadha annihilation tata similarly na not yasya of whom kaivalyat because of being absolute one without a second abhimana false conception akila atmana of the super soul of all living entities parasya the supreme personality of godhead dhamma karatu the supreme controller he certainly himsa harm kena how asya his kalpate is performed translation my dear king the conditioned soul being in the bodily conception of life considers this body to be his self and considers everything in relation with the body to be his because he has this wrong conception of life he is subjected to dualities like praise and chastisement purport only when a conditioned soul accepts the body as himself does he feel the effects of chastisement or praise then he determines one body to be his enemy and another his friend and wants to chastise the enemy and welcome the friend this creation of friends and enemies is a result of one's bodily conception of life so this point is important because we're trying to establish the position of the supreme and how he's dealing with um uh shishupal and dantabakra so the basic reason is that we'll see in the next verse is that he's not affect we would think because the yudhishthira maharaj's point was is here you have the the shishupal and dantabakra saying so many bad things about krishna why didn't their you know tongue fall off or why didn't they you know fall into a pit that you know that led down to hell or you know why didn't something happen but then because that's how we would react but krishna doesn't react that way why because he is not on the bodily concept of life he doesn't identify with his body right we have to remember he is his body right you know while we identify with something that's not us so because of that then this praise and chastisement bother us so we would think if i was in that position i would get upset but krishna doesn't get upset he doesn't see that as a problem right so this is the opening then to to this next verse because this is us right now we come to the next verse 25 because of the bodily conception of life the conditioned soul thinks that when the body is annihilated the living being is annihilated lord vishnu the supreme personality of godhead is the supreme controller the super soul of all living entities because he has no material body he has no false conception of i and mind right because it is all i and it is all mine for him so there's no false conception right it is therefore incorrect to think that he feels pleasure or pain when blasphemed or offered prayers this is this is impossible for him thus he has no enemy and no friend when he chastises the demons it is for their own good and when he accepts the prayers of the devotees it is for their good he is affected neither by prayers nor by blasphemy right so that doesn't affect him because he is who he is right so for the devotee then the difference is is the affection that's where he acts outside of the equalness right equalness is how you deal with them he simply responds the demons behave badly so for them it's good they're chastised the, the the demigods and that are offering prayers so therefore they get dealt with you know get get uh, it's beneficial for them but the devotees act out of affection that's in another category right it's not for something they'll gain the demigods offer prayers to the lord cuz they realize he is the supreme and if you're good, in good with the big guy things work out nice for you 
right? Amrita doesn't run out, you know, all these kind of things. You know, it goes on good. The demi demons don't come up, try to take over, you know, and you have to get off your nice cushions to go out and fight, you know, like that. So they like to worship the Lord because it keeps everything going nicely materially, right? But the devotee, because they, they, they deal in affection, that's in a different category, right? Totally different category. So that's then what uh, makes the Lord uh, interact with them differently than with everybody else. With the demons and the demigods, it's equal. It's just according to their position, they get what is for their benefit. But for the devotees, then it goes beyond because it's affection. Because affection goes beyond the standard, right? It means whatever someone deserves, affection always takes it beyond that. Does that make sense? You know, if it was a particular situation, you would give someone a certain thing, but out of affection, you'll give them much more. Right? Does that make sense? So that's how Krishna works here. So that's what we're, that's the question that comes up. Why is this not happening to uh, Shishupal and Nantavakra? Why aren't they getting such a bad situation? Right? Purport. Because of being covered by material bodies, the conditioned souls, including even great learned scholars and falsely educated professors, all think that as soon as the body is finished, everything is finished. Because right? we're dealing with our position. That's going to be finished. Even you go on to another body, even you believe in the soul and all that, this situation is finished. And because we're in this situation, this is what's important to us. Right? So it's all judged on that. This will be finished. Right? This is due to the bodily conception of life, right? So this is the main point that this verse is bringing out, right? Is that because of this bodily conception, everything we are, con why does it generate this thing? Because if everything's finished with the body, then the maintenance of the body, if it goes nicely, then I feel happy. And if someone gets in the way of that maintenance of the body, I'm going to get upset, you understand? Because if we say, okay, bodily conception is why there's the feeling of, um, how you say, feeling of uh, what, what's here? dualities like praise and chastisement, right? Subjected to the dualities. But how does that mechanically work? That works because uh, we think that the, with the body being finished, then it's all finished, right? Because in other words, if somebody helps me in how my body goes and my situation that identifies me, they're my friend. And if someone gets in the way of that, they're my enemy. Because one is making that it will go on nicely, and the other is making it so it will be finished. You understand? So that's the root. Right? So we have to understand, is no, this is just a passing phase. Right? Okay, so then the explanation. Or excuse me, the reasoning. This is due to their bodily conception of life. Right? Why do you have that? Because of the bodily conception. Right? No bodily conception, you don't have this problem. Krishna has no such bodily conception, so that's why he doesn't get affected like this. Nor is his body different from himself. Therefore, since Krishna has no material conception of life, how can he be affected by material prayers and accusations? Right? So that's then the reason. He, we have a material body that we identify with. Therefore, we have this problem of duality. Krishna doesn't have a material body. He is who he is. And so, therefore, not having this duality, he doesn't feel pleasure and pain due to the situations. Right? That's why he's beyond the modes. Because otherwise, we'll say, he's beyond the modes, this is the, the reason why. Krishna's body is described here as Kaivalya, non-different from himself. Since everyone has a material body, concept, a bodily conception of life, if Krishna had such a conception, that would be the di difference between Krishna what would be the difference between Krishna and the conditioned soul? Right? He'd just be like us, but just bigger. Right? Therefore, then you say something wrong, and then the thunderbolt comes out of the you know, cloudless sky, and there's this little zot, and then this little pile of ash there. And then all the other people around who you know, are following the religious principles, though they would actually not, they would like to not, but they're doing it because they don't want to get hit by the thunderbolt. They got that little grin on their face, that little bit of satisfaction that you know, he deserved it, right? Like that. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's the... That's the point, right? So Krishna's not like that. He's not like us, but bigger. He's just not like us, right? And bigger. 
Krishna's instructions in Bhagavad Gita are accepted as final because he does not possess a material body. As soon as one has a material body, he has four deficiencies. But since Krishna does not possess a material body, he has no deficiencies. He is always spiritually conscious and blissful. Ishwara Parama Krishna, Satchidananda Vigraha. His form is eternal. Blissful knowledge. Satchidananda Vigraha, Ananda Maya Rasa and Kaivalya are the same. Right? So that all means the same. Satchidananda, Ananda Chinmaya, Rasa and Kaivalya. They're the same thing. They just mean they're one. Krishna is one. He's one in bliss. He's one in Satchit and Ananda. He is the form of Ananda. Like that. So he's non-different from himself. Like that. So that's the point that, that comes out. Why Krishna acts in this way. This answers Yudhishthira Maharaj's question, right? So now the exp explanations uh, behind this and examples. Krishna can expand himself as Paramatma in the core of everyone's heart. In Bhagavad Gita 13.3, this is confirmed. Chaitra gyam chapi mam vidhi sarvam chaitreshu bharata. The Lord is the Paramatma, the Atma is super self of all living souls. Therefore, it must naturally be concluded that he has no defective bodily conceptions. Because he's in everybody's body. So he, he, therefore, in that way you can say he can't have a bodily conception because he's the one that's actually making the bodily conception work. Super soul in the body sanctions then our desires and that's fulfilled by the modes of nature. So he has to be beyond that to control that. Right? He can't be controlled by the modes of nature to make that work. Although situated in everyone's body, he has no bodily conception of life. He is always free from such conceptions, and thus he cannot be affected by anything in relation to the material body of the jiva. So he doesn't get disturbed. We do. We connect with our body. If another body, we identify with our body, we get affected by that body also or that situation. So anything that we identify with the body affects us. Well, Krishna doesn't have that because he is the body and that body is everything. So he doesn't get affected because he's simply dealing with himself. Right? So now the uniqueness comes as, is he dealing with, uh, how you say, a loving uh, exchange? That will create the difference in how Krishna deals. But otherwise, he's basically just dealing with himself. So the whole material creation runs by time and the modes exactly according to its direction. Right? It's not going other than that. <coughs> Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita 16.19 Tan aham dvishata kururan samsareshu naradhama kshippam yajasram ashubhan asurish veva yonishu those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among man, are cast by me into the ocean of material existence, into various demoniac species of life. So here, a key thing, it's very nice, Prabhupada's purports and, and translations when he gives, nothing's left out. Sometimes devotees like to think that there's something left out and that in these more technical translations you, you get more. Actually, it's all there. If you understand the technical, you'll see it's all there. But Prabhupada does it in such a way that no one's going to get caught up by the secondary. You're not going to get caught up by the externals of it, and you're actually going to stick to the essence. Like here, those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, right? So we'll just take it, okay, a low-class guy. But as we know from other verses, lowest among men is one of the categories of sinful people who don't surrender, right? The Naradhamma. And the lowest among men means they understand about the Vedic culture, and they reject it. That's a Naradhamma. Right? And so why is that? Because of envious and mischievousness. That's why Krishna says in the 11th canto that, that someone who is opposed to the Vedic version, even though they're a devotee, is not really well situated. Like that. He's making this point. Why? Because they're a devotee, but they're maintaining this lowest among men, men mentality. Right? One has to be very careful about that because everything being non-different from him, you have to know, since it's Krishna, then we can't reject it. Right? Does that make sense? So those who are doing this, so they're going to reject Krishna, they're going to reject anything about Krishna, so unless it's about them and their bodily conception, they won't consider it right. Right? That's the main, main point that will come up here. 
So whenever the Lord punishes persons like demons, however, such punishment is meant for the good of the conditioned soul. But even though they're opposing him, because there isn't anything else other than him, then he's going to do it in such a way that they'll get benefited. Because if you, if something goes, you do something wrong, you get chastised for it, you start to think, maybe I shouldn't do that. And then eventually you come around to the other side of the cycle of samsara and act within the piety. You follow God's laws. Right? Does that make sense? So basically, one's acting in a sinful way, then at one point one kind of starts to see, okay, piety is okay, that takes them up to the top, but then one gets into sense gratification, so that starts you down around the curve, you know, but at some point then it just turns fully demoniac and takes you right down to the bottom, right? So we take it half is going up, half is going down, but the point where you're committed to piety and impiety is cut the other way half-half. You know, that makes the variety, right? <laughs> The conditioned soul, being envious of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, may accuse him, saying, Krishna is bad, Krishna is a thief, and so on. But Krishna, being kind to all living entities, does not consider such accusations. He doesn't take it, right? Against him, you don't have a problem, right? You say it against this devotee, now you have a problem, <laughs> right? Uh, right? But against him, he doesn't have a problem. Like, you don't, you don't see Shushupal talking badly about anyone else. It's just Krishna. Right? But now, what's the difference? Because Yudhishthira Maharaj gave the example of Vena. Now, Vena went to hell. Who did he bother? Devotees. Right? The Brahmins. Not, not God. Shishupal just harasses God. <laughs> right? Like that. So that's, that's the difference. So he doesn't take offense. But you bother the devotees, then that's when the problems come up. That's, does that make sense? Instead, he takes account of the conditioned soul's chanting of Krishna, Krishna so many times, right? Because Shijupa was constantly chanting Krishna's name, right? So he just sees that side of it, right? He sometimes punishes such demons for, for one life by putting them in a lower species. But then, when they have stopped accusing him, they are liberated in the next life because of chanting Krishna's names constantly, right? So they may end up in a funny position, but they'll get out of one life. Right? Because they've chanted so much of the Lord's name. But because the, the attitude's wrong, he stops that attitude. Right? Because as an animal, generally they don't sit around thinking about God so much. Right? It seems something, something that's, a, that's a pattern there. Right? Blaspheming the Supreme Lord as devotee is not at all good for the conditioned soul. But Krishna, being very kind, punishes the conditioned soul in one life for such sinful activities. And then takes him back home, back to Godhead. The vivid example for this is Vritrasura, who was formerly Chitraketu Maharaj, a great devotee. Because he derided Lord Shiva, the foremost of all devotees, he had to accept the body of a demon called Vritra. But then he was taken back to Godhead. Thus, when Krishna punishes a demon or conditioned soul, he stops the soul's habit of blaspheming him. And when the soul becomes completely pure, the Lord takes him back to Godhead. So that's the point, is Krishna being equal poised, he therefore doesn't take it otherwise. So if someone is, is connected to Krishna like this, even though he's blaspheming, then he'll stop that propensity to blaspheme, but the benefit you've gotten from chanting the Lord's name will remain. Right? Does that make sense? And then, then after that, then we'll go back to Godhead. But this does not mean that, oh, then I can go, I can blaspheme you devotee. As long as I'm chanting the Lord's name all the time, then it's great, but this is not the recommendation. Right? <laughs> This is not recommended, because it doesn't please Krishna. Krishna is only dealing in a neutral way because he's neutral. The way to please Krishna is to do it in a positive way, deal with him in a, a positive way, the devotees in a positive way, that therefore they will, uh, the Lord, it will attract him on that basis of affection. Because otherwise it's just he's being kind. Does this make sense? Like, so Krishna being beyond the bodily conception, that's why he doesn't get affected by it. And he just sees what's the good part about it. He doesn't see other things. Right? But it's not that he doesn't reciprocate, because he's equally has to reciprocate how you dealt. You dealt badly, then you'll get a bad situation. Right? But he's trying to benefit the living entity by elevating them as much as they can. Right? That, what's, that's what Krishna does. Okay. Any questions or comments on this? Yes. 
Yeah, that fun little Mikey wikey thingy wiki. Yes. All the way to the back. Yes. Ah. Um, the purport mentions Chitra K2 as um, having, what's the word used? Yes. It says he derided Lord Shiva. Mm -hmm. um, it just occurs to me that Lord Shiva is not disturbed. Yes. Um, so in this sense, he might be in the same category as Krishna. Yes. In terms of that. Yes. Parvati, on the other hand, yes, was because she's not Krishna. Was disturbed. <laughs> she's not, and she's not Shiva. Yes. But she is certainly very close to Shiva. Right. And one might wonder how is it that she is affected and Lord Shiva. Is, is not, not affected. Okay. <laughs> yes. yes. If you'd like to comment on that. Yes, please, thank you. Um, it's because the whole idea is that, see, is that we're looking at the neutral aspect or the point of equality. The chapter is the Supreme Lord is equal to everyone. So therefore, we'll see that in Krishna, we'll see that in, well, in Shiva, we'll even see that in, these great, in the great devotees. So from that aspect, there is no problem. So if he had been saying all kinds of things about Parvati herself, you'd get that same effect. Because it's just, you know, the child says so many things. Sometimes the child gets upset with the mother. You know, the mother does something, the milk's too hot or something like that, so he starts beating the mother, but the mother doesn't care. It does, it's just, it's really not a problem. So, but then you have, so that's the tattva aspect. So this aspect is the Supreme Lord is equal to everyone. The equality aspect is the tattva. But how it is perceived that here it's not so much brought out, but in other places it'll be brought out more and more. How on the platform of rasa, then there's a difference in how he deals. So therefore, in the position of tattva, there's not a problem. In the position of rasa, there is. So therefore, Parvati doesn't appreciate that someone's dealing you know, in pastimes with her husband in an inappropriate way. Therefore, she gets disturbed. But if they were acting on the platform of tattva, then they may not. But here is that the difference is brought out. It's a pastime. It's not that it's a formal situation in which they're there and they're the, they're the deity and so therefore you're worshipping. And if you deal nicely or badly, you're dealing with them as one entity. Here it's a pastime where he's sitting there with his wife and they're interacting and the, and the sages and all this. And then a comment is made on the platform of pastime. It wasn't on tattva. He's not saying about... It means he's alluding to tattva, but the environment he's present... I mean, what he's using is, is rasa. So therefore, it does touch in her area and the relationship with the Lord. You know, he's saying, you're, you're transcendental. You know, and, and, you know, which means your senses are totally controlled and you're not affected by, by sensual desire. But you're sitting in front of the sages with your wife on your lap, right? So if he just had left it with the first thing, then it would have been fine. But he took it to the second and says, I'm here and I'm transcendental and I'm sitting in this, you know, flying airplane with, surrounded by Vididhara girls. You know, it says, isn't that far out? You know, kind of like that. But so then... She didn't appreciate it. You know, it could be also the bottom line is you're comparing her to Vididhara girls? Come on. <laughs> no, okay, there's a whole bunch of them, but still there's no comparison. You know, so whatever is the whole point is that then you bring into it the, f the feminine conception of difference. Well, if you're dealing with them as a deity, then you're dealing with them as the oneness. Lord Shiva and his counterpart is Parvati. You know, or Vishnu's counterpart is Lakshmi. But, but the point is, is they are individuals, so they may act with, as one or may act as different. So in this case, she acted as different. Like that. You know, it's also, we see, it's the Lord's arrangement to bring out the glories of the, the devotees. Because otherwise, it's also probably mentioned that normally she would never have reacted like that. But she did because the Lord wanted to show the point of the greatness of the devotee. Does that, does that work? Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. Yes. But at the same time, uh, we can notice that often devotees are even more sensitive. They become, become even more sensitive to harshness, for example, when they become devotions. So like okay, so saying that if we're, more, if we're more developed in Christian consciousness, we're less affected by praise and, what was the other word used? Praise and chastisement, yes. Praise and chastisement. But also, as they develop advanced in Krishna consciousness, they become more sensitive to the environment. But the point is, is that doesn't mean that they become, a f they, they react badly to it. It's just they may be, they themselves may personally notice it. There's two different things. So one is more sensitive, so you notice that something is not nice. Like that. You understand? But it's, it's, the point is, is, how do they react? Does that make sense? So that's not a problem, these two things. Because then, if you're more sensitive to the situation, you can also be more sensitive to seeing how other, others are affected. Right? So therefore, you get the para, para, what is it? Para dukkha dukkhi? You always got to get it right, you know. It's like, well, like Duryodhana was para, what is it? Para sukha dukkhi? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, Paraduka Suki, yes, yes. When that, if the Pandavas are in trouble, he is happy. Right? You know, so so then the opposite is so therefore Yudhishthira and, and the Pandavas they're actually thinking even Bhima at one point can understand while he's on the battlefield that actually maybe he understood at one point why Yudhishthira was willing to accept five villages. Because otherwise Bhima went along with it because he's his elder brother, so out of duty, but he did not in any way, shape, or form agree with it. When Yudhishthira offered, you give us five villages. But in the middle of the battle, like that, then he understood. Does that make sense? So that sensitivity means then you are uh, you are aware of what how others are affected by the material energy, and so then that brings out the ability to be ca compassionate and nice and all that kind of stuff. Is that okay? And even if they do become disturbed it's not the same as everybody else becoming disturbed because they're actually more sensitive. And that's come from devotional service. Like that. And so the other person who is bothering them will be judged on how much they're affected, not how much what is they're said. Right? In other words, they, they respond less but because they're more affected because of being more sensitive than the, the person who's bothering them will be affected more than if they were, let's say, uh, speaking, chastising someone who's a bit thick-skinned. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. What do you mean by react badly? React badly. Yeah. Like you were saying that um, the person's getting chastised or the person's getting blasphemed or whatever, and then that person, they, the devotee will not react badly. Means they don't identify with it, so therefore they don't uh, get involved in it. But they do identify with it because <coughs> you're just speaking how they're more sensitive. <coughs> they're aware of, because you have what's dharma. See, it becomes, these things on a cultural platform become a little bit... Uh, The perspective of it is different. What, what the Bhagavatam is talking about, it talks about all levels, but when we see how the devotees are responding, they're responding based on the principle of Dharma. What is Dharma? What is my nature? What's the other person's nature? What is the law on how I'm supposed to behave and interact with them? Right? And so that someone's not following the rules, following the Dharma, then that, that may affect them. Well, if we're dealing below that on the modern cultural thing of pranamoy, which doesn't have anything to do with dharma, it's all about whatever I feel and whatever my friends or my circle I work in, what they say is, is correct, then I get affected. So that's based on the bodily platform. Does, does that make sense? So they'll, like, beat them up or something like that? No. What has that got to do with it? Well, they'll go to extreme to 
um, to counteract their plan. No, it's just based on what there's the previous question, it was they will notice that lack of proper social interaction based on the scriptures. And so that may affect them that, you know, that they're behaving like this, they're going to get a bad reaction for that. So they're aware of it, while someone who's thick-skinned doesn't bother them at all. Is that, does that make sense? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Someone else had a question? Yes. All of the members of ISKCON are, have some basic understandings um, yes. that you mentioned, that we should be non-envious, that we're not the body, that Krishna is the Supreme Lord. Yes. That those of us who, if you live here in Mayapur for a little while, you start to notice that there's, uh, there's two communities, there's the, or it seems like, the, there's the Bengalis, and the Bengalis refer to people who aren't Bengalis as the foreigners or the Western devotees. And the foreigners and Western devotees talk about them as being the Bengalis or the Bangalas. And it becomes like two separate communities that aren't always harmonious. How, how could everyone become united? We already have a philosophy that we're not the body we have so many philosophical concepts that that s seems like we would unite everybody in Prabhupada's service, but then you ha you have this disunification, and what what needs to be done to make it so that we can all be more united together? Mm -hmm. Means you have the uh, means uh, that you would say. Um, I would say you'd have many communities. It would be inappropriate to say that you have two. You have one, yes, you could say one is the Bengalis. But that one that's the Bengalis includes anybody, even if they're not Bengali, if they follow a culture. Like that. So in other words, you could say this would be the bottom line. One community actually follows the traditional culture and the other one doesn't. And then within the other one that doesn't, it has many subdivisions because the Europeans don't get along with the Americans, they don't get along with the Asians, they don't get along with the blah, blah, blah. So it just happens to be at, at certain times and you can kind of group them together, but otherwise, no. So, because for the Bengalis, it's just, if you follow your, you, the etiquette in dealings, then you're fine, and if you don't, then you're, it's not fine. So it has nothing to do with if you're a foreigner or not. Foreigners who basically have a very minimal eclectic exposure come to these foolish conclusions. And I will say that extremely strongly, because when you say someone who's been here for a little time, we've been here over 40 years. And I have never seen this division. I've seen Westerners create the division for certain political reasons for a short time. It's happened in the past. It's happened th this is the third time it's happening in 40 years. But it's always created by the Westerners, 100%. The Bengalis respond to it because they don't like being dealt with badly. But it has nothing to do with whether you're Bengali or a foreigner. Bengalis, out of all the Indians, are the ones who least see that who's foreign, who's that. You go to North India, it's like you're North Indians, you know, like that, Jai Hind and the whole thing, and then you're a foreigner. But the Bengalis are the most inclusive of all. Otherwise, how, is, how do you have Haridas Thakur and personalities like this? You know, you have the great, from great Brahmin backgrounds down to shooters, like they're the most accommodating of all this. So any Westerner who thinks that they're the ones that are group and political and that, they have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, zero. And I don't mind, I don't care who it is, I'll take them all on. <laughs> because anybody who's saying that is not actually a serious resident of the Dom or doesn't come here hardly at all. They just walk in to manage a few things and walk off. Therefore, what put, goes into doubt is their understanding of community, of culture. Like that. That's the whole point. That's the bottom line. So, the only route now to go to your question, then the only way you can really deal with it is being Krishna conscious. 
Is it about Krishna consciousness? Is it about pure devotional service? Or is it about some mundane, atheistic, pranamoyic, uh, moralistic value system that they've somehow or another gained from association with you know, their background before joining Krishna consciousness and they just somehow or another, due to attachments, like to encourage it and bring it out and because they find others who will agree with them from the back, same kind of backgrounds, then they have something to keep their bile moving so that their lunch gets digested. You understand? So the point is, is it's the culture of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. People may follow it nicely, may not follow it nicely, but it's Lord Chaitanya's culture. So if you don't like the Bengalis, you don't really like Lord Chaitanya. Like that. And I'm talking top to bottom. I'll take anybody on. So you have to understand, it's simply a political thing dreamed up because it's very easy to tell the difference between a Bengali and a Westerner. Right? You don't need, it's not rocket science. But much of the time when they're saying Bengali, sometimes they're not Bengalis, they're from another part of India. And they can't tell the difference. So it's not really Bengalis in that. It basically means uh, we're, 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 the, we're the Europeans, you know, of the European stock. We're the first world and we're superior to every other culture in the world. That's why in the past history we've gone all over the world and destroyed every culture there is that's different from ours. <laughs> and so now we're just continuing the same glorious history. So that is where the problem lies, you know. Bengalis are Bengalis. They have their own weaknesses and this and that, but it doesn't include destroying other cultures. But the weakness of the Western culture is it must destroy. It's based on passion and ignorance. So, therefore, getting off the bodily conception will make both everything work nicely, but it has to be the only way you can do that is if pure devotional service is the central feature. And I'm telling you, atheistic, modern, moralistic, pranamoyic views will not suffice. Vox populi will not suffice. It has to be based on what the Acharyas say, what Prabhupada says. It has to be, it's about pure devotional service. What is the problem? So therefore correct the problem and bring it to pure devotional service rather than, oh, I see a problem, throw it out. Prabhupada always makes the point you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You find the problem, correct the problem. That's what has to be done. But that means then you have to be Krishna conscious. The other thing is just politically very nice and it's a very good thing to keep one going. Keep one, keep one. If one's not interested in pure devotional service, you can get distracted by this. But if you're into pure devotional service, you don't get distracted. Therefore, you can live in Mayapur also for a long time and not see any difference in the community. The point is, it's because it's Chintamani Dham. Being, being Chintamani, you can get anything you want. You want to see difference? The Dham will give you difference. You want to see the same? You'll see the same. It's up to your desire. So those who see a difference, that's what they want to see. And Maya is giving it to them. And it's just that. Understand? Like that. Okay. Something else? You had something over here? No? Yes. Okay. No, here, that one first. She was first, and then, because she didn't raise her hand the second time. So was... Hare Krishna, uh, you think Krishna forgives if we, uh, by mistake, offend Vaishnavas? Does Krishna forgive? Um, the point is, is do we understand a problem? Do we understand we've made a mistake? So based on that, then there's something to do. Because the point is, you can only be, 
you can only be um, relieved of something if you see that it's wrong, right? And then that will be complete when you're determined not to do that again. It doesn't mean you won't do it again, but you're determined not to. But by habit, you may do it again. But you see it's wrong, you shouldn't do that, and you won't commit yourself to that. At that point, then now it's something that you can be move on from. Right? But there's also the recommendation, if you have the opportunity, the facility, then those who have been offended, you say you're sorry. Right? And mean it. <laughs> like that. So it's connected with the other one, yes. Okay. So last question. Here. Uh, Maharaj, in your description of Shishupala, it was interesting that he was chanting a lot of names of Krishna, yes. but he was not offensive to devotees. He yes. was only focused on Krishna, so there were, affection was not involved, but also he was not uh, getting, uh, he was not offending basically Krishna because he, <coughs> Krishna didn't take it as offense. No. And he got uh, benefit after all in the next life. He can say benefit if you call a Kaivalya. Yeah. Benefit. I just want we would to say it's not benefit. Cause in in it's your description, benefit. it reminded me a devotee, an FI devotee who is nice to everyone, but affection is not involved in his dealing with Krishna. Let's say that he's chanting holy name not uh, without affection, in an offensive way, a brother. But not, he's kind to, nice to everyone. He's not, he's not arguing or criticizing devotees, but in his japa, he's not very much like. No, but he's not against Krishna. It's just he's not. See, the point is, is we're not used to thinking of things in connection to Krishna. Sense gratification means I don't think of it in connection with Krishna. That's the, that's the definition. We think sense gratification is what you're doing. No, it's not, is doing that not connected with Krishna. That's sense gratification. Eating is, is not sense gratification. It's eating without connecting it to Krishna's sense gratification. We take it that engaging the senses is sense gratification. No, engaging the senses not connected to Krishna is sense gratification. Engaging the senses connected to Krishna is called bhakti. See, this is the difficulty we were talking before. These, we get these concepts that aren't based on dharma. What's the nature of something? The senses just perceive, perceive sensual uh, information. But it's only called sense gratification if it's, not, if, if it's not seen in connection with Krishna. So that's why when we think no sense gratification means no, not engaging the senses, so nothing. But that comes from mayavad. So we're used to thinking there's sense gratification or, and that gives us trouble, so we don't want trouble, so we don't engage the senses at all and we get liberation. We're used to these two ways of thinking. So this original way of thinking where I engage the senses but connected to Krishna doesn't make sense to either one, the karmi or the jnana. The karmi, I engage the senses, all that work, why won't I get the benefit? The other one is that why I should work at all, I don't want to engage the senses. Right? I don't want sense gratification, so why should I engage the senses? So that's why bhakti becomes so difficult to understand. This particular, one particular point is the most confusing point. You understand? So the thing is, is here, we're not used to the idea that it's about Krishna. We only think about Krishna's energies. That's why we're here. We want his energy without Krishna. That's called maya. In the spiritual world, they only see his energy in connection to Krishna. In other words, there's Krishna, and then his energy is used to express that love for Krishna. Well, here, the energy is separate from Krishna. We use the energy to express our love for ourselves. You understand? That's how it works. So we're trying to switch that in the consciousness. You do that, you actually are Krishna conscious. That sidesteps all these different things. All the sensual, political, material, all these different things that are there. Because it's, 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 it's about, you know, economics. Is, is it connected to Krishna or not? It's not about if people are dealing badly with the money or not. It's about, is it for Krishna or not? That's the problem. Somebody takes money, what's the problem? It's Krishna's money, that's the problem. Not that, oh, it's bad to take money. That's a materialist. Anybody who thinks like that is a materialist. You understand? That's the difference. And so, because the whole Western culture is based on this materialism, and devotees are uh, by, either by design or by ignorance sus making themselves susceptible to this Western way of thinking because they're trying to fit in 
and adjust with the modern culture, but it means fitting in with materialism. It's not, there's no glorious philosophy here. It's not that, oh, we're not the body, we're preachers, and so therefore we can adjust. Pranamoy is pranamoy. You're the body or not, it's still pranamoy. We have to remember, we're not the body, but the body is the body. It remains the body. It doesn't change. Not that I become a devotee and now I'm Superman, so I can just do anything, right? The body remains doing exactly the same thing it was doing before. So devotees have to be able to discern between what, what, what is the body and what's not. What's, what is dharma, what's not. What is engageable in Krishna's service, what's not. So something connected to Krishna is engageable. Something not connected is not engageable. So that's, that's how you decide. Then of engageable, then the things recommended by the Shastra is the best to, of engageable. Things not recommended by the Shastra, if you could connect them, great, but that's for your situation at that particular moment. It's not recommended. Does that make sense? So we have to go beyond this modern, mundane, politically correct way of thinking. It's totally mundane. You can connect it to Krishna, but the point is, is it's a mundane platform to begin with. And because of that mundanity, it clouds pure devotional service because pure devotional service is not about that aspect of what you're doing it's why you're doing it and so then that brings into question why you're using that secondary aspect right in other words if I say it's about the primary not the secondary then the natural thing comes out oh then you can use any secondary but then the point is is what's your motive behind using that particular secondary is it primary so much of the time we see no so, if it's not primary and it's going to be secondary, then who defines how that secondary should function? Does Krishna define it by Shastra? Or do we define it by my, my mental concoction and anybody else who agrees with me? That's the bottom line. That's the real thing that one has to understand. That's then what makes all these different, different seeming uh, problems, social problems. It's because of not using the actual scientific system to analyze them, but using something of a much inferior quality that has never worked for anybody in the Western world in the last 3,000 years. Right? Best scholar the West has basically ever known, killed by, you know, this modern kind of thinking. Right? Then you go into the Romans, probably one of the best administrators that has ever been in history, killed him also. Right? Then after that, one who is pretty good at running things and all that, he's sitting down there in Corsica drinking horse urine. You know, so the Western culture is not designed to, to encourage greatness. It's, in, it's designed to encourage mediocrity with the ideas if everybody's mediocre, I might get more. It's not a good culture. It's a bad formula. It hasn't worked in the last so many thousand years. It's not going to work today. Because the point is, is yes, we're not this Western culture, but the Western culture is the Western culture. Just like we're not the body, but the body is the body. Use inferior materials, you'll get inferior results. The bhakti aspect may remain, but you know that you'll get inferior results. If I use potatoes that are partly bad and cook a sabji, I'll get a, I get a potato sabji that's partly bad. Does that make sense? So that's the whole point. So we have to be very, very careful. We have to scientifically know what we're working with, especially in a modern context where science is so glorified. But at the same time, as people in their own personal view of things are less scientific than any, ever, less realistic. You go back a couple of hundred years, people were much more realistic about life, who they were, what they can do, how things function. And today, illusion is like the standard. You know? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so we'll end here. Jai Granta Raj Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Samaveta Bhaktivinanda ki. Jai Nitai Gaurupayamanandi. Jai Nitai Gaurupayamanandi.